Hello and welcome to the Acres USA Healthy Soil Problem Solving Webinar. My name is Sarah Day-Levac and I'm so happy you can join us here today. Uh, these are always really fun for us and hopefully for you and our audience as well as they are an opportunity to glean some insider tips on how to manage your soil health and a chance to ask some really spectacular experts your questions. Uh, today's webinar features a conversation with SoilWorks Research and Development Manager Chris Niffin and founder and owner Glenn Ravenberg. Glenn has spent decades applying his knowledge of animal science to the soil, and he and the team at SoilWorks treat the soil as a living, breathing organism, correcting the cause of poor soil health instead of reacting to the symptoms. Chris and Glenn will have a short conversation and then open it up to audience questions. Please remember to submit your questions in the chat function and um, they will be happy to address them. I hope you enjoy the session and now please welcome Chris and Glenn. Good day. Oh, Ron. What are we gonna start with, Chris? Well, I thought that we could start with, we had some questions that came in earlier. Um, one of them really kind of piqued our interest and thought it'd be a great way to segue into a lot of different topics. Uh, so what we're gonna start with is how can you fast track the increase in soil carbon? Oh, that's a great question. <clears throat> When we look at soil carbon, there's a lot of companies that have worked very hard to put that anywhere other than the forefront. And what I mean by that is we are a carbon-based society. We have to have carbon in our own bodies personally for our immune response. Animals have to have carbon and plants, soil and microbes all have to have carbon. And there isn't one good answer that can fit all the different soil types. So we have a limited amount of time today. So I'm gonna to try to cut to the chase as quick as we can. And we're just gonna consider two different extremes for soil. One would be sandy. Sandy soil has a large particle size. It doesn't want to hang on to many things, and it likes to leach everything through it. And the lighter the color of sand or soil, the, the lower the carbon content in that soil is. So we, we have sand that has a lot of air, but it doesn't have much carbon and probably doesn't have a lot of minerals. Uh, a lot of our growers in some parts of the world would consider that soil to be this may not be correct to say, but it's more diuretic, that things don't stick with it. If we go to the opposite end of the spectrum, we look at heavy clay soil, which is usually comprised of high magnesium. This high magnesium normally has a lot of nutrients. It's tight. It has a higher level of carbon than what sand does, but the limiting factor in high magnesium, compacted, tight, lumpy, clumpy, clotty, crusty soil, the biggest uh, element that holds that soil back from performing is air, i.e. oxygen. So when we look at how do we work, how do we look on getting a fast track to building carbon in the soil? Number one, if you're dealing with sand, you're going to want to put several different types of carbon sources in that soil. Number one would be sugar or molasses or compost. And please check the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the products that you're putting in. If you haven't received a carbon to nitrogen test on your soil test, please ask for that because the carbon is essential in that soil. And what I mean by that is most soils that we have tested across the world, not just the U.S., but many other countries, a lot of the soil organic carbon, not total carbon, but organic carbon that microbes like to eat, <clears throat> that organic carbon to nitrogen ratio will be eight or nine or maybe 10 to one carbon and nitrogen. And many of the university professors will say, oh, shoot, you have probably eight or 10 times more carbon in your soil than you do nitrogen. 
And that's true. But the one thing you have to remember is to get a good microflora of beneficial soil bacteria, the workers in the soil, the digesters, the creators of food, all of those fantastic microbes that work for us in the soil have to have at least a 15 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. So if you're looking at trying to build your carbon level up and if you don't know where you're starting at, how do you know what you've gained? So a lot of the growers we work with is we want to see what the soil test is and we also want to see what the carbon to nitrogen ratio is because if you're at a 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen and you're adding no extra carbon and you throw microbes out there, you will not see the true potential of that microbial pack. So make sure that they have food if you're going to put them out there. How do you do on that one, Chris? I thought it was great. I'm going to interject and just give it in a little bit different um, language. So the scientific community talks about what exactly what Glenn said is as biologically liable carbon. So this is carbon that's moving throughout the soil plant system. When we talk about sequestering carbon, sequestering carbon comes from managing of the biological liable carbon system. So it's really important that we when we look to sequester and draw down atmospheric carbon that we are focusing on the movement of the biological carbon between the soil. It's the driver of sequestering carbon and it's not a direct linear relationship that I can take atmospheric CO2 and pump it in the ground and boom, that's it. It has to be, it has to be moved through the, through the plant. And when we talk about carbon being a net positive, that's what's cool is because we can start utilizing that liable carbon to grow a really high quality nutrient dense crop that transfers through from the plant to the animal to the human. One thing to add, if I may add with that, Chris, mm -hmm. a lot of people are looking at humates or humic acid or fulvic acid. Those are fantastic carbon products, but please, please, please keep in mind they are highly manufactured and they have a high level of carbon and a low level of oxygen. Here's what I mean by that. If you pump a bunch of high carbon humic acid or humate on tight soil, you may run short of oxygen. Now, microbes in the soil that are beneficial and aerobic take in this atmospheric air, <clears throat> keep what they need, they exhale CO2, carbon dioxide. If you're a little short of oxygen, carbon dioxide, take away one molecule of oxygen, carbon dioxide can be carbon monoxide. We've seen that in soil. And how do you know if you're getting carbon monoxide in your soil versus carbon dioxide? One of the things that we always talk about, and if you can see this, this is a penetrometer with a gauge and measuring the compaction of the soil. Good healthy soil should contain 25% air. You have to have 25% air to have the 25% holding capacity of water that makes up healthy soil. So if we're under 200 pounds per square inch, that's a low enough surface tension or pressure that the atmospheric air can, can push down in and start biologically complexing, not just carbon, but also nitrogen out of the air. So when we do a stress test on the soil with a penetrometer, if you don't have one, please talk your neighbor into buying one and tell him if, you, if, you, if he buys it, you will show him how to use it. But that penetrometer is important. It's vital to make sure that air is getting in the soil because carbon dioxide can move to carbon monoxide and even worse, carbon in an airless environment, if you jack nitrogen in there, that can form cyanide. So there's many different forms of carbon that can be detrimental if you don't have oxygen hooked to it. So with that, back to you, Chris. <clears throat> I'd like to 
on that note, talking about different carbon inputs and carbon sources, how do you feel, uh, what are your thoughts on the biochar and the use of biochar as a carbon amendment? Great question. Um, I'm going to give a political answer. From from what our what our scientists are telling us, most of this carbon in the biochar isn't truly biologically available, or a very small amount is, but it creates a housing space for the microbes. We have seen some success with the biochar, but what we found to be more successful and more beneficial is opening up the soil and creating that soil structure that is supposed to be there. And what we mean by that is the clay particle, let's just say that, uh, that this is the sheet of paper is a clay colloid. And when they talk about base saturation, they're talking about 100% of the nutrients that are hooked to the outside of this clay particle. And if your base saturation is correct, according to uh, Dr. Albrecht, who's a fan, who was a fantastic scientist, he wants 68 parking spots on this sheet of paper or the clay colloid to be calcium, 12 to 13 parking spots to be magnesium and so on and so forth. But what happens is when these sheets of paper start stacking one on top of the other, that's compaction and a positive charge that every clay colloid has on the flat surface and a negative on the edge, all of a sudden the rules of physics are being broken. And when you can, when you can address the true cause of soil compaction, it's a lack of available calcium. And calcium will take these, these stacked compacted clay colloids and they will start standing them and creating I-beams. And that's where you get interstitial fluids. That's where you get your air capacity, 25% in the soil. And that's where you're going to get your water, water holding capacity as well. And one of the things that we see with that will we'll slide right into another question. Most of the soil that we're dealing with is a higher pH than what most people like. General terms, if you can be between a 6 or a 7 pH, that's relatively good. To If you want to pinpoint it, a 6.4 is what we have found to be the best. A lot of soils we deal with are running a 7, 7.5, 8, 8, 8.3, 8.5, and they don't know how to get that down. The pH is abnormally high. And here's how mother nature can fix that soil for you and can naturally balance that soil. Going back to the clay colloids, when they start eye beaming and creating flocculated or structured soil, that creates air and that creates space for the microbes to eat, to breed, to party, to do their deal and to make work happen and create food for the plant. As these microbes are working, they are breathing, they are huffing, they are puffing, they are hard at it. And every time they exhale, it's CO2. Carbon dioxide, when combined with water, H2O, forms carbonic acid. So CO2 and H2O make carbonic acid, a natural acid that naturally forms in the soil. And you'll see just a little bit of a drop of that soil pH. And when we see that soil pH drop, just maybe say a tenth of a point or not even that, we see other microbes coming back to, uh, coming back to work because the environment is a little bit closer than what they need or enjoy and they start working. And many of these strains that start showing up are some of the lactobacillus family. And these are lactic acid producing microbes. Are you picking up what we're saying here is that they're producing little acid, they're producing a little more CO2, the next rain or the next irrigation event, you can naturally balance, naturally balance the pH of your soil just by, by allowing the microbes to do what they naturally do. 
going back to the beginning, if you have set, if you have sand, you have plenty of air, but you don't have very much carbon. If you have high compacted soil, or if you, or if you have high mag, if you have high magnesium soil, you have a lack of air. If you have a lack of air, you have to open that up and allow air into that so that the microbes can cr create CO2 so the water can get in there to form carbonic acid and the lactic acid. And all of a sudden you're gonna see a whole lot more things happening other than just a little bit better plant, you're gonna see better soil porosity, you're gonna see less diseases, you're gonna see lower weed pressure, you're gonna see lower disease pressure, and you're gonna have an environment that was designed to be ecologically and economically feasible on its own. Sorry, I got a little long-winded on that one, Chris. No, that's that's great. And I, I think it's really interesting, too. And I'd like to hear your comments. Uh, you know, when we're talking about high about high pH, but in the Pacific Northwest in the Palouse, they deal with a lot of stratified soils. Uh, a lot of them are in no till management, uh, but they are very acidic. Would those same rules and principles apply to raising a pH as they do lowering? In most cases, what we find is when you have a low pH that's normally sandier soil or lighter soil, and many times the calcium has migrated down through that profile. One thing we wanna remember, every mineral has a job or several jobs within the soil, within a microbe, within a plant, within an animal, within a human, and, but every mineral also has a personality. Calcium's personality is to move down through the profile. So any calcium, no matter what form it's in, any calcium you throw out there, you wanna to topically apply it. And with moisture, it will slowly migrate down through the profile. If you bury it, the only way it's gonna come back up in the profile is through the root of a weed. So calcium needs to be topically applied. One thing to look at if you're putting out gypsum, if you're putting out dolomite, or if you're putting out uh, calcium carbonate or pella lime or a limestone, those are bonded up by mother nature and God and they're, they're a fairly tight bond. And if you have airless soil, tight compacted soil, you don't have any many microbes to break that apart. If you have a high pH, you don't have a lot of acids to break that apart. You either have to have acids and microbes in order to break that bond. So opening up the soil first, whether it be mechanical before you apply the calcium, give every element and give every input you have a good fair chance of working when you apply it. Uh, Chris? One other question came in here um, and it's a really interesting question and I'm gonna kind of feel this to Glenn. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit technical here and I'm, I'm just gonna read it off off here. So it, uh, it was from Stephen here and it says, sounds thus far that you're only looking at building carbon primarily through the decomposition pathway, including with amendments rather than recognizing and acknowledging the microbial carbon pump and pumping carbon into soil via photosynthesis and exudates feeding microbes that poop and become necromass. This, that's deep carbon and minerally activated organic matter as opposed to liable carbon in particular organic matter. Now I have worked enough in, with Glenn and with Soil Works Under and kind of know where the direction is. So I'm gonna kind of steer it this way because what we've seen and what we're doing is by using microbes and biolog biology and that liable carbon, we can in fact improve the carbon content of the leaf tissue of the plant and of the plant exudates. So I just wanted to hear Glenn talk a little bit more and explain a little bit more about building, what it takes to build nutrient density in, in plant tissue and building carbon in the plant tissue and then how that will in turn feed the soil microbes and build that deep carbon in the soil. Oh, I tell you what, 
very good, fantastic, advanced question. Thank you for sending that in. Um, before I address that, I want to jump back just for a second on the lower pH soil. I didn't completely finish that. On a lower pH soil, you'll probably find that your base saturation of calcium is low. And in most cases, the absence of calcium is what's keeping that pH low. Granted, calcium does a whole lot more than just add to the pH, but it creates the environment. So if you've got a lower pH, like in the Pacific Northwest, West, what Chris has been mentioned around sandier soils, you're going to have to do an addition of some sort of a, of a calcium. Now on that soil, uh, smaller amounts more often is more economically advantaged to you, the grower. And what I mean by that is most soil won't digest more than 500 to 750 pounds per year. So if you're going to put two or three ton down, a lot of that's going to slip through the profile with gravity. You're going to lose it to a lower profile in your soil and it's not going to be available. Now, one of the things we're trying to do, and the question is actually fantastic that came in, we, and we'll try to pick up the pace. We haven't gotten there yet, but when you look at photosynthesis, the two minerals that we have found to be the most important minerals for increase in photosynthetic property, number one, available calcium, number two, available phosphorus. Keeping in mind sugar, the chemical formulation of sugar contains carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. You can have all the minerals there. And so many times guys that were, were traveling and walking their fields, I will show them a refractometer to measure the sugar content. They go, oh, good Lord. I bought one of those 15 years ago. I threw in the drawer because I can't find anything to raise the sugar content of my plants. In most cases, they're not getting photosynthetic opportunity to speak of because of a lack of air or oxygen within the soil. So what you will find in the quite going back to the question is absolutely you can increase the sugar content of a plant with available calcium and phosphorus and that calcium and phosphorus that makes the sugar, much of that sugar will, will go into a root exudate during the vegetative or anionic growth of that plant. So you can build the sugar in the soil from the plant, but please get comfortable because it's going to take a while. You may have to do some additions of some compost, some straw, some ground up hay, molasses, humic, humates, fulvic, sugar, molasses, whatever it may be. And the more varied sources of carbon that you have, the better the result is. And please keep in mind, we're feeding microscopic bacteria. So small amounts of nutrients more often will aid in the biological process as well as the photosynthetic process of that. Chris, do you have anything else to, to add on to that? No, I think that summarized it up really well. Um, you know, some of the things that we've seen uh, in different um, tree crops is the direct linear relationship of increasing plant available calcium and phosphorus as it relates to building carbon, building yields. Um, so there's, there's definitely a, a mineral component that drives a lot of these carbon pumps. Um, and so it's, it's important to, to look at that as it also relates into the soil and uh, your mineral content in the available pool as well. That's one of the things, and we're getting some questions in on different testing methods and also on, on calcium. So maybe Glenn, you're a calcium expert. Let's, uh, let's steer the conversation a little bit. And can you tell us a little bit more about calcium as it relates to availability and what makes a calcium product available versus soluble versus a dry product? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of calciums out there and, and calcium is kind of like people. If you generalize and stereotype people, you're going to run into trouble. And the same thing applies to calcium. Calcium in, in my little world in South Dakota for, for the last 30 years, I've kind of looked at calcium being the mother 
of all nutrients. And what I mean by that is when calcium is available, she's the finder of all lost things. She's the fixer of all boo-boos. She's a creator of a wonderful environment, just like the female is in any home, in any good home uh, environment. If there's a problem, mom is usually the first one on the scene. So a lot of these calciums that, that are on the market, it's a, it's a good source of calcium, but it has to be broken down or it has to be divorced from something else before it can be available. In other words, calcium may be married to a carbonate or it may be married to a nitrate. It may be married to a colloid or a, a, a chloride. It may be married up to a sulfate. A divorce has to happen to separate that compound before that calcium can truly be available. And then depending on the microbial activity in a perfect world, if that, if that calcium can be digested by a bacteria, a beneficial soil bacteria, along with some carbon and some oxygen and some other things to make up a, a biological casserole, that is the most efficient way to run all the minerals through microbes that create plant food. Now, there's a difference in carbon. If we were to spend an incredible amount of money in carbon, let's just say obnoxious amount of money, and we throw a bunch of diamonds, yes, half carat, two carat, three quarter carat, almost pure carbon, what's that gonna do for your soil? <laughs> Well, if you dig them back up, it'll make you rich. But microbes have to be able to eat the carbon. So if you're looking at a graphite source, or if you're looking at a, a diamond or a very tight, heavily bound carbon or a pure carbon, it has to be an organically complex carbon for the microbe to run it through its body and to start the, the carbon cycle from the air down to the soil back up in the tree because here's the other thing is that's basically what we're selling people when you look at the dry matter weight of a plant no matter what plant you're growing or selling on a dry matter basis 47 percent of the composition of that plant should be carbon so please start checking not just the sugar content of the fruit or the, or the vegetable but checking the leaf because a deficiency of carbon in the plant is normally one of the first steps in having insect pressure, having disease pressure, having problems within the plant. So sorry about that, Chris. Uh, back to you for possibly another question. Yeah, no, and, and just to, from my perspective, because I see a little bit more on the technical side coming into soil works, one of the things I would really suggest people to do to understand this concept of available and soluble versus your, what you see on a base saturation is to start looking at a saturated paste analysis of calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium, and look at how they relate. You can have a perfectly balanced base saturation, and we've got a lot of guys that work really hard and spend a lot of money to get that perfectly balanced base sat, but then they look at their saturated paste tests and they go, oh, these are all, I've got more magnesium than I know what to do with. And so that's the real key is you have to be looking at both of those different pools and then once we identify the problem, now we know what to do next and to correct it. I wanna bring up one other comment here that was just brought in about worms and dung beetles that tunnel to open up soils for more oxygen. And Glenn has this wonderful explanation about worms and about where they should be in the soil. And so I'll, I'll just leave it, at, leave it at that to Glenn. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, my background is animal pharmaceuticals and biologicals. And for uh, a lot of number of years, I was trained by nutritionists, veterinarians, and, uh, and herd experts, livestock experts. And we studied manure. In fact, I studied manure so much that they said I was uh, a shitologist and I had my degree in manureology. And um, what we looked at, we also looked at the intestinal tracts. And, and keep in mind, I'm from South Dakota. Please don't hold that against me. But I look at the top portion of the soil or the aerobic zone of the soil to be like a digestive tract. And what we have found is if you have worms in your digestive tract, or if you have worms in a digestive tract of an animal, 
a good efficient grower will spend money to get rid of those worms. Well, like here's, here's the short version of a long story. Worms are showing up in the soil that that soil has become a little bit too tough or a little bit too rough of an environment for microbes to handle. So the worms, which are aerobic, beneficial night crawlers and earthworms and angleworms, they will move up or they will move in to try to break some of these compounds down in order for biology to keep going with it. Now there's two different sets of worms and there's also microbes. So let's just say if we, if we found a piece of earth that was pristine and that was perfect, what we would see in the upper aerobic zone of the soil would be primarily all microbes and beneficial fungi. If that pristine soil starts to degrade or has been beat up a little bit and it's missing something, air, carbon, available calcium, phosphorus, pick, pick your mineral or pick your element because microbes and life and, and food producing plants have to have all of these. But if the microbes don't have everything they need, they will spore off or go dormant. And so then worms will move in to try to break that down. Well, if the degradation of the soil keeps continuing and the earthworms and the angleworms and the night crawlers can't fix it, then you'll get another lower set of worms, armyworms, wireworms, rootworms, cutworms. They're trying to cut off the roots and eat the plants so that plant doesn't continue to pull nutrients from a mineral or a nutrient deficient soil. So what we find is when we, if you have the detrimental worms, I, army worms, wire worms, wire worms, root worms, and cut worms, you improve your soil. Now all of a sudden you start getting angle worms and earthworms. Everybody's like, yeah, 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 we got it made. We got worms coming. You've improved the soil, but you're not where you need to be yet. Go one step further, and usually that's that's an increase in carbon, that's an increase in oxygen. It's going to be an increase in available calcium and phosphorus because the biology of the soil have to have available calcium and phosphorus for their physiological structure, for their muscles, for their bones, for their structure, for their endo or enero structure. In order to get everything going, the microbes have to be there. Okay, sorry, Chris. I was, I'm getting wound up here. I, oh, I love what we do. That's that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, Sarah, where are we at? We're we're a little over uh, on our time here. Um, yeah, I would say if we have, I think we might have one or two more questions in us. If you guys are, if I know Glenn has the energy for it, <laughs> I'm ready. All right. Um, let me go back here. While Chris is looking for a question, I'd like to put up one thing is we love looking at soil tests. We live looking at soil tests, but please don't just stop with the soil test. Take a look at the tissue content in the plants that you're growing. And this is gonna be a general set of numbers, but what we have found across the US, Canada and other countries, these numbers are the beginning of success. When you look at your tissue, your petiole, your sap test, please, please look at the calcium and phosphorus first. When you can get 2% calcium in the tissue of a plant and three tenths of a percent phosphorus, that's the beginning of photosynthesis. That's the beginning of physiological integrity. That's the beginning of a higher sugar content and a higher root exudate and a better viable source of microbes in the soil. There's a lot of companies that don't stress the tissue levels high enough because when you get 2% calcium and you get three tenths of percent phosphorus, it's just the beginning but when you get to that level, all of a sudden you're going to say, hey, this is how Mother Nature is supposed to work. And you will end up buying less stuff from companies. And that's the goal is to help the grower. Okay, sorry, Chris. Uh, so we just, in, in that, we had a really, uh, a really good question. This is, this is going to be a tough one. So J.R. Joe says, do you have any thoughts on soil that is compacted and very high in iron? Wow. It's a tough one. 
Um, I guess the first the first question is, and, and here's the thing. Um, when, when we look at healthy, and this all goes back to the healthy soil summit that Acres uh, has put on. When I look at the word healthy, uh, there's a lot of different definitions of healthy, but the, the explanation I like is without disease or impairment. Um, and I don't, I don't want to just sidestep this, but just being high in iron doesn't give us enough information to make a good logical and a good analytical scientific answer to that. So wherever that question came from, if you could please email us, we can get into depth with that. But if we don't know what the calcium is, if we don't know what the phosphorus is, if we don't know what the carbon to nitrogen ratio is, if we don't know what the penetrometer reading is, and the other thing is, if we don't know what the EC reading is, the electricity created by microbes or other elements, we're just going to guess. So anything short of having an iron mine, if you want to farm that, we may we need more information to be able to do that. Because here's the thing is we can't just take a magic wand and go abracadabra, poof, the iron is gone or the potassium is gone or the salt or the sodium is gone. Every microbe, every mineral has bonding capacities, but based on what you have in the soil is going to be determined on what the approach is to truly fix and create an environment that is beneficial to you. Yeah, I think it's it, it's interesting. There's, um, you know, when you get into iron and, and aluminum as well, you get into these, you know, plus, you know, two plus three, and these different minerals that have different species based on pH. And so there's more to that story and and you know we do a really good job on on a lot of things but there's still this world is there's a lot of things that uh we're still learning every day so um more information is of course needed um to really diagnose things as a ph issue or, or so forth um but uh happy to help in any ways if you want to reach out um there was a question here about uh fungi and so there's a lot of talk about bacteria to fungal ratios Glenn, what do you feel is if as a somebody coming new to the biological farming system, what's more important? Do you need to have a bacterial soil or a fungal soil? Because a lot of people are saying fungal, but I've seen both sides of it. So what, what are your thoughts on it? Great question. There's a lot of growers across the country that uh, have responded to all of the talk about the fungal movement that you need a bacterial to fungal ratio and you've got to have mycorrhizal fungi and the beneficial fungi in order to make it happen all of the things that the company or the salesman has told you about mycorrhizal fungi is probably true they are important they are fantastic they are essential yes 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 we need them but here's the key if you have an eight to one or a 10 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, you don't have enough carbon to keep microbes alive, let alone fungi of the beneficial side. So here's the, here are the sets of the numbers. And this came out of the NRCS we found for several years ago. And the NRCS numbers paired up very closely with what we found. If you want to have a good diverse count of colony forming units of microbes, beneficial soil bacteria in your soil, you got to be at about a 15 to one carbon to nitrogen. 15 to one is the lowest level that we've found where you have a wonderful burst of active, healthy, productive microbes in the soil. You need to be 18, 19 or 20 to one carbon to nitrogen to get the beneficial fungi to react those those fungi from what we've seen are kind of a a pretty pretty princess they want a lot of carbon and they are a carbon sucking pig and they enjoy a lot of it and if it's not there you're not going to see the benefit of the mycorrhizal fungi now on the on the other side when your carbon level gets below an eight to one, that's where you start seeing some of the detrimental pathogenic disease causing bottom end fungi, the Phytophthora or the Rhizoctonia, the Pythium, the rusts, 
they enjoy a lower sugar content, but the, the good beneficial aerobic uh, mycorrhizal fungi and, and the different strains, they like air and they like carbon a lot. So please don't buy any and put it out until you know you've got enough carbon to support them. How are we All doing right, we on got, that? We got, we got one more and this is gonna be a great wrap up. Um, and, and I'm gonna just let everybody know too, uh, we'll follow up if there's any questions that weren't answered, please reach out to us at SoilWorks. Um, our staff here is more than happy to help you guys uh, walk through any of these and uh, answer any questions you have. But uh, as a final kind of wrap up, um, in a real succinct manner, Terry had this, uh, Terry Best put this great question out, please connect nutrient dense food to soil health. In less than 10 <laughs> words. <laughs> You, it's the chicken or the egg. You got to have both. So if you're looking at the soil and you're seeing all the nutrients and nutrient dense, it's a term just like regenerative that a lot of people have have jumped on it and, and almost prostituted some of these terms. But nutrient dense in less than 10 words. If you have a lot of weeds growing in your field, you're not nutrient dense. If you have detrimental Phytophthora, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, bad fungal diseases, you're not nutrient dense. If you have plant feeding insects, if you have weeds in your field, if you have any, any problems, if your soil isn't healthy without disease or impairment, if you need a chemical or if you need something to get rid of a problem, you're not close. A plant has to be able to grow on its own by itself without outside influence or chemical or synthetic uh, application, if, if that plant cannot grow by itself without being interfered with, it is not nutrient dense and it will not keep a, wh whatever or whoever eats it healthy. So it's usually a lack of calcium. I went over 10 words. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> a, I'd like to... One. I'd like to go on for three hours, but um, the, the wonderful people of Acres say that they're limited on time, so I apologize for that. Sarah? All right, um, thank you. I still see a few uh, few questions coming in, but uh, as, as uh, Chris mentioned, please do follow up with Glenn and Chris. Um, thank you, Glenn and Chris. Lots of excellent information here. Um, and thank you for sharing it today with our audience. Um, I, you're right, I'm sure we could go on for three hours. <laughs> um, thank you all out there for joining us and sharing all your great questions. Uh, we will follow up soon with the details for accessing the replay of this conversation. Uh, so you'll all be able to go back and soak up um, even more of the details that Chris and Glenn discussed today. Uh, so I think that's about it. I'll let Chris and Glenn say so long one more time and thank you all. Hey, thanks for being here. It was a pleasure. And like I said, if there's something that we explained that didn't make sense, or if I if I messed up on the explanation, please send us, give us a call or an email, and we'd be more than happy to, to go through it and explain it the best way we can, because everybody deserves and wants healthy soil. <laughs>